So we're back with Dalila, uh, my incredible, wonderful, lovely colleague from California. Uh, and today I want to talk to you specifically about list of things that seem to me be very typical in post-Soviet countries, so to speak, well, now in Georgia, and I've also seen and, and know this these to be the concern in um, in Russia and other countries, something that still causes a lot of arguments, a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, and um, quite opposite opinions. Let's remove the myths, if possible, from um, just one of these, which is um, the court clamping. Okay. Seems yeah. like something so understandable, and for a long time it has been a custom already to leave the cord uh, pulsating, mm -hmm. right, until the pulsation is over after the baby is born. And yet, at this point, as a doula, I am encountering so many uh, little bumps that uh, the parents run into. And these bumps are very unexpected because there seems to be a big variety of opinions among the medical staff as of when is it okay to cut, cut the cord, yeah. when is it useful, when is it um, already dangerous to leave the cord unclamped. <laughs> and these uh, time limits, they differ so much, even within the same hospital. So one doctor can say that, you know, it's okay to leave the court for as long as you want to. For example, in Russia, like our doula friendly and natural birth friendly doctors are okay with it. Mm -hmm. And yet the midwives who they work with, and this uh, more frequently comes from the midwives in my experience. And they're like, no, you have to cut the cord in like two minutes. And then the other midwife would say, you should cut the cord in one minute. Oh, not later than three minutes. And yeah, otherwise it gets dangerous. For the, and, you know, you, you obviously have a lot to say about that. I've, I've also witnessed this in this part of the world, especially. Um, first of all, in, in, in healthcare institutions, there's no cohesiveness as far as like a shared uh, value system, first of all, and then a shared guidelines that people are following. As So you can come into the same hospital and depending on what nurse and what doctor you get, you can have a completely different experience. Because people are really practicing anecdotally, mostly. They're practicing based on how what they're used to, what they heard. So it's not evidence-based practice at all. And it's actually a little bit shocking for me because there are, in, 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 in obstetrics, there are a lot of gray areas, right? Mm -hmm. But this is actually not a gray area. There's There's been so much conclusive evidence that for me to even it's like so 1990s to have this conversation. <laughs> yeah. About, like it's right? just like who still is doubting the evidence? I mean, uh, it, it, I would I would actually go as far as to tell a woman if you are encountering a healthcare provider that is telling you anything like it's dangerous um, or there's a specific one minute, two minute, I'd probably pick another healthcare provider because they're if not. There um, is an option, but if there is not an option, there's, there's not, no oh, one to choose from. Right? That's I a different story. To have the choice, of course, that not a lot of women yeah. have. But so the the evidence, and I also want to say that I also distrust any any healthcare provider, especially when it comes to childbirth, um, that says there's a certain way to do something. There really isn't. There's as many ways as there are women and situations, and you have to assess every situation individually. So delayed cord clamping. It can be anywhere from 30 seconds, can be up to several minutes. And it really just depends on the woman's body, right? Sometimes the cord pulsates for several minutes because the, the placenta hasn't separated from the uterus. And so the babies, you're still getting all that blood flow. And sometimes the placenta separates as the baby's coming out. Yeah. You can feel that the placenta and immediately the, the cord becomes flaccid. Again, sometimes, so you have to really judge each situation individually. Um, rule of thumb is, unless there's a reason, a medical reason to clamp the cord, and medical reasons include the, pe the, pe the pediatrics team is having a difficult time, uh, the baby's not breathing, they need to take the baby to the warmer to resuscitate the baby, it, mm -hmm. that happens. 
uh, of course we clamped the cord, right? We're not, nobody's having these extreme positions of under any circumstances, we don't clamp the cord. If there's a medical indication, we clamp the cord immediately at the request of the pediatrician. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, babies are fine. You, you, you babies yeah. are born, we put the baby on the mom and we allow the cord to pulsate for as long as it, it, it does. Another caveat to that is some parents uh, increasingly um, want to bank their the cord blood. Okay, yeah, they, that's so actually a very big one. It's another big point. In that case, there is definitely also guidance from different organizations, um, and some kind of differ, and you have to use your clinical judgment. So what you're trying to do when you're when you're uh, banking uh, the cord blood is you're trying to find that balance of uh, giving time for the blood. To, to pulse the cord to pulsate and get some of that blood to the baby because we have to remember like a third of the baby's blood volume is still in, outside of its body when it's born yeah. right so you want you want the baby to get that blood those white blood cells those antibodies you know babies that get delayed cord clamping 90 seconds have you know great ferritin uh, and hemoglobin and iron stores for several months of their you know of their lives these are not things you can just gloss over these are really important things um yeah. so you do want to give the give time for the cord to to pulsate but you also don't want to wait till it's completely flaccid because then you won't have anything to bank okay so in that case mm -hmm. you have to honor the wishes of the parents so you find that balance and every situation is going to be different you're going to be making that judgment as the baby's coming out as you're observing the cord is the cord full and thick like we see like coiled cords that are full of blood mm -hmm. sure wait a little bit is the cord becoming a little bit more flaccid in your hands and you can feel the pulsation stopping and you want to bank that blood i would stop then but the consensus in general from all the different organizations uh -huh. if you bank the blood give 30 to 60 seconds. That way the baby gets all the good benefits, but then you still have enough, wow. right? That's so great that you're clarifying that because um, see, I didn't know the guidelines here. What I knew from some doctors in Russia, but I, I never checked what they were saying, but um, I knew that it's either you allow the cord to pulsate or you cut it and then the, the parents have to choose. And now you're saying that actually there is oh. a win-win here situation. And this is why I, I always urge uh, women to be a little bit weary of any doctor that says, this is how I do things. I let it pulsate for this amount of time or I don't at all. But because you can't trust a clinician who speaks like that because they're not using their clinical judgment in real time. So every woman is different. Every birth is different. Every cord is different. Every placenta separates at a different time. And so sometimes the placenta, we wait up to 30 minutes for the placenta to, to, to come out. And that's fine. That's a variation of normal. Anywhere from zero to 30 minutes is considered normal. And we just, we have to allow for that to happen. So again, I, I, I when I teach women, I always say, certain things should be red flags for you. When, when a clinician tells you, this is how I do things all the time, really for every woman, for every scenario, for every wow. baby, how? How can you have a blanket approach when all women, and the same thing with your other question that when we were chatting earlier, you asked about, you know, delivery and how you yeah. deliver each it, there is, there is, a, I can, I can tell you about the physiological way of how it should be done, but then where is your clinical judgment in exactly. the moment? Exactly. Like the, 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 it just really, uh, I got goosebumps when you said like the person is not using his clinical judgments and I'm immediately thinking like, this is why you are there for as a clinician to use your clinical judgment and to evaluate the situation clinically, because I'm a doula. It's out of my scope of practice to deliver babies, right? To make any clinical judgments as of like, how is it better to do in what way, right? And yet looking at some clinicians in this area of the world, how they um, justify their work saying that I have done it for 15 years. Don't teach me. I know better. I've done it always, and this is how I do it. In your place, anybody could be, right? So what's, what's particularly the point of having you when you're just doing what you're taught to do, regardless of who you are dealing it's with very, here? It's a very lazy approach to, you know, uh, it, it's you're not really participating. You're not 
actively participating in 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 this birth. You're just kind of coming in and you're doing what you're programmed to do. And so yeah. this you're applying kind of an algorithm to every single situation and it gives the clinician control, but it actually doesn't do much more than that. It doesn't it doesn't improve outcomes, it doesn't improve the experience of the mom. Um, and it's actually not evidence-based at all. But it's it's particularly difficult in this part of the world because again, there's no cohesiveness. Like in my practice, we have as a, an entire department, our maternal child health department, which includes midwives, nurses, doctors, ped pediatric staff, we all have a common value system. We all want to do delayed cord clamping because we believe in that, you know, uh, skin to skin. We believe in all of those providing that golden mm -hmm. hour mom, encouraging and facilitating breastfeeding. So we're all, that's all of our mission. Okay. Not only is it just yeah. our mission, it's also something that we are, we have benchmarks for these things. We're being checked to make sure that we are, you know, yeah. actually addressing these, these um, uh, measures. Um, and so when, a, when a pediatrician in that setting tells me, I need you to clamp the court, I trust that pediatrician. Because I know that when they say that, there's there's a need. There is no conversation back and forth. Sure, sometimes, depending on uh, you know who I'm with, there may be some kind of, oh, do we really need to do this? We may have that conversation. But for the most part, we trust that we have a similar value system and we're in a cohesive kind of environment. And if that needs to be done, it's done. There's no questions asked. Mm -hmm. Safety comes first. Uh, but in, in, in settings here, you'll have a, one provider who wants to support you in doing delayed cord clamping, but then you'll have a pediatrician who'll be like, clamp the cord and cut it. Um, and so then you have in the middle of a, a birth that you're supposed to be focused on the woman and the baby, you're having yeah. these side conversations. Then you as a doula have to advocate and then they get offended. And then there's all these conversations and who and who, they they react more so like it becomes like a becomes a power a really like a, a, yeah power struggle that is very getting verbal you know very it's, short but quite are, loud and verbal like why what right. what, what are you it's, telling it's, me we've done it all the time through yeah. this and this is the setting in which a woman is giving birth. So again, yeah. these are issues, right? We are addressing issues of incompetence on the staff of the clinicians and just laziness and not being up to date. Every doctor, I don't care how well you did in school 20 years ago. Uh, everything when it comes to medicine. That was and a long time ago. I mean, it's for 20 years, we have to yeah, for 20 years, there have been so many medicine. discoveries. Yeah, yeah. So I, that's not interesting to me that you did well 20 years ago, or you have a nice job, or you have a great reputation, because if you're not keeping up with, with the, the new information, the new guidelines, you're really not much use to anybody. Um, and so you, you there's the individual responsibility of the clinicians of just not being uh, responsible and 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 having in, you know a clinical integrity, and then there's also this cohesiveness that just doesn't exist in the healthcare setting in the department. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of these things play play a role, and then you add to that the fact that there's really so many barriers to having support from people like you. You know, uh, in 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 general, it either doesn't exist, or now with COVID, we have even more barriers to access to that. So then we just yeah. start peeling away at at having a healthy, normal experience. Yeah. So one of the things that is being um, thrown at the parents here or, you know, in other countries that are still practicing the um, fear <laughs> around the delayed cord clamping, they say that the blood that comes from the placenta into the baby in a couple of minutes will mm -hmm. start flowing back into the placenta. Well, I mean, that, what do you that, think about that? I, I mean, that just tells me that they truly have no concept of human circulation and fetal <laughs> circulation at all. I mean, this isn't two the vessels theology, that you're just maybe. tipping like two cups and, the, and it just flows back and forth. Uh, a baby is a human with a very complicated circulatory system uh, that requires a pump, which is their heart. And, and you know, there's a it's not an empty vessel that if you lift up, the blood just empties out of the into the placenta again. I mean, I feel like it's even silly to even ha have that explanation because um, that's just not how it works. It's just, it's like saying that, you know, if we if we if we put a hole in your arm and I tip you, you lose all your blood volume like a a, a bucket. Oh, it just doesn't account. work like that. Um, we have an intricate system of blood vessels that you can't empty just by tipping a baby over. And also understand that the uh, the the placenta is 
is like a it's like a pump. I mean, it really actually works. It, it, you know, the pressure is going into the baby um, in many ways, and that's the direction in which it goes. So there is no, um, yeah, it's just it's it's not. It's just difficult to even come, take seriously any doctor who would yeah. What, what would, would say you recommend? Like, if you were, let's imagine some clinicians are watching this. What would you tell them to uh, look at? Or the guy, I don't know, like, what year was that when they discovered that? What do you think they are afraid of really here as clinicians? I think it's a lot about control and about maintaining control um and uh it's it's just a culture of uh not being challenged and uh, and understanding and accept and perceiving uh these questions as a personal a attack so when you ask questions of oh uh, where do you uh where what are you getting where are you getting this information what guidelines are you following they feel personally attacked and that's again it's it's a cultural thing you know it's an unhealthy um kind of dynamic that healthcare providers have um not all i've met some really great healthcare providers here who are very open to having these conversations so again yeah, you know definitely. it's absolutely not every every, every doctor but Absolutely. Overall, that's just kind of the, you know, the culture, the culture of like doctors are not questioned. Uh, we know, we studied, we know better. The one concern that people had about delayed cord clamping actually had to do with the opposite. It's not that the baby would lose blood. It's actually that the baby would get too many blood cells. Um, uh -huh, and as that we was know, the other one. Mm -hmm. and, and they have kind of, there's an increased incidence of jaundice. Right. We all break down red blood cells and we eliminate yeah. them. And Their liver is not mature to break right. down yeah. the bilirubin and all of that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's why when, the, when we break down red blood cells, that bilirubin, that's why babies get a little bit yellow and jaundice until they begin to digest food because we get it, we, you know, we, we, we remove all that waste through our digestive system by mm -hmm. peeing and pooping, not by peeing, but by pooping. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, you need to start eating and you need to start digesting food and you need to start eliminating. And that takes time for babies to do. Um, and so the fear was that, oh, you're going to have increased jaundice. Um, and so now what we know, you know, there are some studies that show there's a little bit of an increase in, just, in jaundice, but not in any way that is significant. What we are now encouraging is that's why all of this is a, is a package. It's skin to skin, delayed cord clamping and initiation of breastfeeding. And why we do that is because all of these things work together. We want the baby to start eating. We want the baby to start pooping. We want the baby to move all that waste out, right? This isn't just like, a, you know, some hippie, uh, you know, oh, we want everybody to feel great. This, there is a science behind this. It right. Makes, there is evidence. There is evidence. nature what? that is very wise yeah, and has invented it this way. Well, mammals, by the way, right? So we're not, we're not that different. So that has been debunked over over many mm -hmm. many studies now we know that the benefits of cord delayed cord clamping way outweigh the, the the whatever risks we have of sometimes increasing the risk of jaundice how we cover that is we encourage women to breastfeed sooner we yeah. put the baby on the breast immediately we get that kind of digestive system flowing so and what i would tell those doctors is i mean i nothing i, I try not to talk to those doctors i i, I generally don't waste my time convincing people. Um, and I know that you're in a position a lot of times to do that. Um, I would, I try to, I think the better thing to do is to educate women. I, I, I hope that I spend my time while I'm in Georgia doing that. I try to educate them. I have classes about this um, because when they have that information, they ask the right questions. And I encourage them to have the courage to ask the right questions and put people on the spot. Demand that you are told why something is being done. Um, and if and if and if they're passionate about it, then provide evidence for it. Um, you know, it's it's going to be. It's difficult. It's not easy because it's a power struggle and some women don't want to engage in that. But I think ultimately doctors have to understand that um, we as women, as consumers of their services, have a say in what what kind of experience we want to have and who we want to pay for our for our for these services. So if you want to be competitive yeah. in, the, in this new kind of healthcare market, um, you know, you should you should really kind of do the job of educating yourself and being able to answer those questions. I can see how the doctors might be responsive to that kind of an approach. 
but I definitely don't see how to get to the midwives who are very old school and who are not even a separate uh, professional who is given the authority to run the or manage the birth, right? They're all yeah. under doctors here. And for example, uh, I was t today helping with breastfeeding to a client of mine who was taking my prenatal classes and uh, they labored together with her husband and had a beautiful experience. Uh, he was supporting her greatly. They were Georgian speakers. Mm -hmm. And they told me a few examples of how the midwife, who was just one of the midwives on call, was treating their requests. And one of them was related to cord clamping, which kind of inspired me to talk to you about it. Um, she said, the baby was on me, everything was perfect, and I was in this condition, like so overwhelmed with emotions and all of that. And in a minute, I remembered, oh, and told her husband, like, honey, the cord. And he was like, yeah, don't cut the cord. And they had told them before. They had told them when they were doing the prenatals. They, they had told them when uh, the birth was still going on. And yeah. they were like, oh, okay, the cord, remember? And she was like, well, we already cut it. And they watched it on the trim on the video afterwards. And it was like less than three minutes. And they were like, but we told you not to do it. And she's like, well, I'm working um, following the protocols and I've done it all the time. So yeah. the problem is that the, you know, people, well, in my experience, my clients, women who I teach, they start talking, they start voicing their needs, but they run into complete ignoring of their needs because at the moment, there is not a clinical judgment taking place from this provider, but rather her, in this case, experience comes into play and disregards the mother's wishes. And this is really upsetting. It is. It is upsetting. And, uh, you know, I mean, if they if, if she let it pulsate for two to three minutes, I that's that's already impressive to me. I you know, I that's more than I've seen uh, done in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's it's also the it's not even just the clinical aspect of it. I think it's just the, um, the basic lack in of communication skills with women and, and then families and partners. Um, you know, just the, just the, it, the concept of, um, consent and the concept of, um, not being, not doing something to a woman's body without notifying her or having a conversation about it. Um, that's also distressing. You know, these are, these are all like, like things that are concerning because uh, women are essentially removed from the decision-making process. Not only are her her wishes not, um, again, we can. We, there's times where we can't honor every wish. Again, we have to assess the clinical situation. But how much better would this woman feel if you had said, you know, I know we had planned uh, to do delayed cord clamping as much as as long as possible, but the baby seems like it needs a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of help. So it'd probably be better for the baby to be taken to the warmer. So I'm going to cut the cord or the cord actually, look, you can see the cord is completely empty and flaccid. It's not pulsating anymore. It's been two minutes. It's, you know, your placenta separated a little bit sooner than, than average. So I'm going to cut the cord. Again, it's a conversation. A woman feels like they're part of what's happening to their bodies and they're not upset in that scenario that things of didn't course. go there. Women, I always say this, women are not upset by the outcome of their birth. They're upset by how they were treated. That's all yeah. that they remember at the end of the day. Yes. Were they treated with respect? Were they considered in the decisions? Would somebody look them in the eyes and say, look, this is what needs to happen right now. This is what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I just want exactly. you to understand. They feel honored. And they're fine. Even if you planned to have a vaginal birth, but somehow things turned where you had to have an emergency C-section. And if you were included in all the decision making, you understand why those things were happening. You are fine. You're OK. You accept yeah. it because we're reasonable people and we understand that there's an uncertainty with everything. But it's the problem, again, is that women are not considered at all. They're like a vessel and you just exactly. do things to them. How do you teach a person not to do that? I mean, it's really hard. It's it's reprogramming a person's person's person completely.